University. Chancellor, Vice President, Equity, People and Culture, members of the faculty, graduates and esteemed guests, I present to this convocation the candidate for Doctoris Honoris Causae to be conferred by York University. Cory Doctorow, a novelist, an essayist, a lecturer, and one of Canada's most vocal technology activists. <laughs> Cory Doctorow's science fiction novels, a total of nine at last count, have been translated into dozens of languages and shortlisted for even more awards. From cyberpunk hackers trying to reclaim democ democracy to money launderers, drug dealers, and dishonest law enforcement. His novels are adrenaline-driven examinations of the underside of the digital world. Once a creative writing student at York, Corey left an indelible mark on his instructors and his peers. As a longtime contributor to Wired, The New York Times, and The Guardian, he has written extensively about big technology and its relationship to culture and artists. As a co-editor of the popular blog, Boing Boing, he has considered culturally relevant topics from open sharing to cryptocurrencies to Disney World. He was formerly director of European Affairs for the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, a nonprofit civil liberties group defending freedom in technology law, policy, and treaties. He also co-founded the open source peer-to-peer -peer software company, OpenCola, and sold to OpenText in 2003, and he continues to serve on countless advisory boards. However, as the theme of some of the conversations here today, his path was not always so clear. He admittedly took an unorthodox route to his success. He spent seven years completing secondary school and eventually dropped out of four undergraduate programs, a fact which I learned earlier he's quite proud of. <laughs> Despite this, he has uh, grown into and is, remains excuse me, an eager student. Moreover, perhaps because of this, today he's much, as much a teacher as he is a learner. His insatiable appetite for sharing, collaborating, and learning from others is visible in everything that he does. He is a firm believer in equity. He has long argued against the imbalance of power and technology. He has written extensively on digital surveillance and political capital, and who gets access to and who controls technology. For more than two decades, he has advocated for a diversity of participants online. And he has criticized uh, the limitations of copyright laws, calling for a reimagining of the system to allow the most diverse works to reach the most diverse audiences, all of while being fair to the creators of this content. As an optimist, he believes that technology can also be a tool for positive change. And we're all left to contemplate what this looks like. But this is what Cory Doctorow does. He asks that we consider our roles in an ever-changing world and one where the future is unscripted. So it is with great pleasure that I present to you, Chancellor Taylor, candidate for the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, Cory Doctorow. Dr. Doctorow, by the authority vested in me by the Senate of York University, I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Admito Tayad Gradum. Congratulations. I will now call on Dr. Corey Doctorow, H.C., to address convocation.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, goodness me, what a gigantic honor to be here today and to be recognized in this way. And I'm profoundly grateful to the faculty and the administration here at York, to my friends and family in the audience, especially my parents who put up with a lot as you just heard. <laughs> so I wanna tell you a funny story about York. Uh, when I was 21, finally graduated high school, I visited this campus to inquire about enrolling in an interdisciplinary humanities program. I'd had a weird educa education. As you heard, I took seven years to graduate from my four-year high school, Seed School, Toronto's great original alternative school. I was accustomed to designing my own curriculum, and, uh, I, and one of the reasons I had stuck around at Seed for so long is I loved its writing workshop, uh, which was student-led and filled with great writers and critiquers. I started selling short fiction when I was 17, so I came to York, and I told the guy who ran the humanities department that I was already selling short science fiction, and I'd like to work on that here. So he called the head of the creative writing program, and the conversation went something like this. Hey, Bob, it's uh, Tom down in Humanities. I got a young man here who is selling science fiction stories, and if he enrolls at York, he'd like to take some creative writing courses. What do you got for him? And then his face fell, and he hung up and he said, he says they only teach you how to write literature here. But I enrolled anyway. Um, I didn't take creative writing courses. I'm sorry, there was a little factual uh, 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 split there. Uh, and I only lasted a semester, but that is not an indictment of York. Uh, I dropped out of three more universities, and I never got a degree. It, it, I just wasn't cut out for it. But that incident stands out, and not because it offended me. Rather, it's memorable because it's the last time that anyone ever looked down on me for writing science fiction. As I moved into technology, I was surrounded by people who thought that science fiction was literally the coolest thing in the world. And I think they're right. A couple of dozen books later, and after two decades working in digital human rights and in in intergovernmental bodies like the EU and the United Nations, I've had cause to reflect on science fiction and its connection to politics, literature, and the human condition. The human condition is not good. We are in the poly crisis, this widening gyre of climate emergency, inequality, infrastructure and neglect, rising authoritarianism and zoonotic plagues. And that's not the bad part. Uh, stuff breaks. The second law of thermodynamics is not up for debate. Things fall apart. Assuming that nothing will go wrong does not make you an optimist. It makes you a danger to yourself and others. Nothing will go wrong is how we got, let's not put lifeboats on the Titanic. Let me say, to hell with optimism and pessimism. Optimism and pessimism are just fatalism in respectable suits. Optimism is the belief that things will get better no matter what we do, and pessimism is the belief that things will get worse no matter what we do. And both deny human agency, that we can intervene to change things. The belief that nothing will change, that nothing can change, is the wrecker's most powerful weapon. After all, if you can convince people that nothing can be done, then they won't try to do anything. Thus, Margaret Thatcher's dictum, there is no alternative, a polite way of saying resistance is futile, or as Dante had it, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. This is inevitabilism, the belief that nothing can change, and it's the opposite of science fiction. As a science fiction writer, my job is to imagine alternatives. There is no alternative is a demand pretending to be an observation. What it really means is stop trying to think of alternatives. At its best, science fiction demands that we look beyond what the gadget does and interrogate who it does it for and who it does it to. This is an important exercise. I think it might be the important exercise. It is the method by which we will seize the means of computation for the better, betterment of the human race and not those immortal, rapacious colony organisms that we call limited liability corporations to whom we represent at best a kind of inconvenient gut flora and which are rendering the only planet we know of in the entire universe fit for human habitation uh, an environment that we can't survive in. Now, the Luddites practice science fiction. Perhaps you've heard that the Luddites were technophobes who smashed steam looms because they feared progress. This is an ahistoric libel. 
The Luddites weren't technophobes, they were skilled technical workers. Textile guilds of the early 19th century required a seven-year apprenticeship before you could make cloth. It's like getting a master's degree in engineering from MIT. The Luddites didn't hate the looms. They smashed the looms because their bosses wanted to fire their skilled workers, shipped up, ship up kidnapped Napoleonic war orphans from London's orphanages, and lock them inside the factories for a decade of indenture to be starved, beaten, maimed, and killed. Designing industrial machinery that's so easy a child could use it is not necessarily a prelude to child slavery, but it's not not necessarily a prelude to child slavery. The Luddites weren't mad about what the machines did. They were mad about who the machines did it for and who the machines did it to. The child kidnapping millionaires uh, of the Industrial Revolution insisted that there was no alternative and the Luddites roared back the hell you say there isn't. Now, today's techno-millionaires are no different. Mark Zuckerberg, he used to insist that there was no way that you and your friends could talk to each other without being comprehensively spied upon so that every intimate and compromising fact of your life could be gathered, processed, and then mobilized against you. He said this was inevitable, as though a bearded prophet came down off a mountain with two stone tablets and intoned, Zuck, thou shalt stop rotating thine log files, and lo, thou shalt mine them for actionable market intelligence. When we demanded the right to talk to our friends without Mark Zuckerberg spying on us, he looked at us like we just asked for him that water, for, for water that wasn't wet. Today, Mark Zuckerberg, he's got a new inevitableist narrative. He says that we're gonna spend the rest of our days as legless, sexless, heavily surveilled, low polygon cartoon characters in the metaverse, an idea he stole from a 25-year-old science fiction novel. As a science fiction writer and an activist, this boils my blood. The point of science fiction is to hone our Luddite reflex and counter every claim of there is no alternative with the hell you say there isn't. Science fiction does not predict. No one can predict. If we could predict the future, then what we did wouldn't matter because the future was coming no matter what we did. In the Inferno, Dante sentences the fortune tellers to a pit where their heads are twisted around 180 degrees so they forever look behind themselves as they trudge naked through boiling molten feces goaded on by demon's whips. And I think Dante let the fortune tellers off easy. Science fiction writers were not fortune tellers. We do not predict. We do the opposite of predicting. We contest. Science fiction demands that we always seek out alternatives and where we, where we find something better than fatalistic optimism, where we find hope. Hope is the belief that if we make a change that betters our circumstance, that from that new vantage point, we can espy previously obscured courses of action that will bring us closer still to a better future. And hope is how we'll get through the poly crisis. For decades, we've been strapped in the back seat of a bus, speeding towards a cliff. All of us back here in coach have been hollering that we need to hit the brakes or we're all gonna go over the edge. But the first class passengers in the front rows said that we were wrong, that there was no cliff. And besides, the bus has to go forward. It's inevitable. There is no alternative. Then as the cliff grew closer, those one percenters, they changed their story. Yeah, they admitted, there is a cliff, but the bus is just gonna have to go faster so we can jump the canyon or maybe we'll innovate and put wings on the bus before it reaches the edge. In any event, we can't stop the bus. There is no alternative. And now the bus is going so fast and that cliff is so close that braking is no longer an option. We gotta yank the wheel and we gotta swerve. Up here, in, up there in first, they're saying, swerve, are you crazy? If we swerve, the bus could roll. Someone could break a leg. It's too late for braking, so we've got to speed up and jump the canyon. There is no alternative. But there is an alternative. We can rush the driver, we can grab the wheel, we can swerve. If the bus rolls, we can look after the people who are injured in the roll, but we do not have to go over the cliff. Maybe science fiction is not the kind of literature that the York Creative Writing Program valued in the early 1990s. That is 
fine. It's a big world, and there's room for all the literature, all the genres, all the styles. Go on, let your literary freak flag fly. Woo the muse of the odd. But if science fiction isn't that sort of literature, it's still an important literature. Hope begins with the ability to imagine alternatives, and there is always an alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much.